My name is Tim Connell, and our topic today is cultural heritage and war, with particular, though by no means exclusive, reference to the uh, Middle East. Uh, a very warm welcome to our distinguished panel, one of whom actually flew in from the Middle East last night and is on her way. She's just getting the sand out of her costume. And um, with a symposium, we have the chance to look at a subject from a variety of angles. We won't have questions after each speaker, because we'll have a round table brains trust with questions from the floor in the last part of the afternoon's program. Um, I think we're going to have quite a lot of interesting angles. There are chances of coming up with any firm conclusions, I suspect, uh, um, rather optimistic. Now, the impact of war um, on the Middle East, in Iraq and Syria in particular, have been catastrophic. Mesopotamia, the cradle of civilization, some would also say perhaps it's a deathbed currently, has seen enormous damage, going back in particular to the Iran-Iraq war, which we sometimes forget went on for eight years, 1980 to 88, horrific casualties and massive amount of damage, give you some sort of idea. Um, and in the context of today's symposia, if you look on the left, this is a tell, which is a kind of mound where there is some important... Uh, item of archaeological significance, pitted with shell marks, dug in with trenches, and this one was actually used um, during the war as a fire base. So lots of ways in which um, important sites can be damaged, and of course we know both urban and cultural treasures have been damaged. Worse, however, was yet to come with the emergence of ISIS, ISIL, or Daesh, as you wish, and apart from the many atrocities committed by both military enemies and civilians, it's quite deliberately targeted the rich cultural heritage of the area, as we shall be hearing, most notoriously perhaps in Palmyra, though even minor sites such as the Tells have been dug through for artefacts to be sold on the black market. We'll be hearing about that in more detail shortly. That's Nimrud going up in smoke. Um, to the Western mind, and doubtless to many others, the violence and the wrecking are incomprehensible. But our experts will be looking at these points in more detail I learnt very early on, I think with our first symposium, I enthusiastically explained in the first 15 minutes what we were going to be talking about. And our keynote speaker stood up and said, thank you for, to Professor Connell for making those points. As he has said, Professor Connell reminds us. Professor Connell very wisely commented that. And, as Profe and I was kind of going like at the beginning, so we're going to cover all sorts of parts of the world, not necessarily the Middle East. I shall leave that to the um, real experts, just to place it in a wider context. Religious intolerance, conflict, iconoclastic behaviour are by no means alien to Western culture. The Romans deleted Carthage. They even sowed salt into the ground to prevent agriculture. The Aborigines were hunted almost to extinction in Tasmania in the 1830s. And smallpox blankets were distributed to the Indians in North America. Um, a prime example, some of you will know I'm an old Latin America hand, so even in a lecture on the Middle East, I will get Latin America in somehow. Um, the black legend will tell you that in Mesoamerica, from the American-Mexican border down to the middle of Central America, 1519, the Spaniards arrive, a population calculated at 50 million. By 1600, when the Spaniards take a census, there are 2 million. The population has collapsed as a result of ill-treatment social disruption and the importation of European diseases accidentally in that particular case. Now, there were highlights in the form of churchmen, um, Dominicans like Bartolomé de las Casas, who in 1512 pushed through the laws of Burgos to ensure that the new subjects of the King of Spain were treated actually with rights under a feudal system as well as obligations. By 1537, the Pope had agreed that the Indians were human. They weren't some kind of pack animal to be used in slavery, to be used in mines. They were rational. They could therefore be catechized. They therefore had rights as well as obligations, which leads through to the new laws in 1542, which, of course, were largely ignored. Now, we get on to characters like Motolinia, Diego Duran, Bernardina de Sahagún, who are starting off as missionaries. They learn the local languages as fast as they possibly can and are fascinated by what they find. Um, Sargun, is it? Yes, Sargun has left us two and a half thousand pages of first class ethnographic material taken from people in the years just following the conquest. But the chap I want to talk about in this context is 
uh, Bishop Lander of Yucatan. He was sent down to the south in the 1560s to stamp out idolatry, um, which he did, and he stamped on a lot of Myers at the same time. He destroyed artifacts in every possible way, such that today we only have three of the um, codices. There's one on the right there, and of course, um, put an end to a major civilization. You might have seen just recently uh, on the BBC a Canadian lad, a 15 year old who's keen on astronomy, has put some Mayan um, documents together and realized that there was a location of a major city we didn't know about. He got onto the Canadian Space Agency, they went over and took a photo, and they've discovered yet another city. Not settlement, but city down near the border with Belize. Um, now, late in life, and far too late, he realized that actually um, he had been dealing with a highly complex civilization. And to his credit, he spent the last few years of his life backtracking rapidly and trying to find out as much as he could um, about the civilizations which, of course, had collapsed as a result of the conquest. However, we don't have to go as far as Latin America to look at religious intolerance, conflict, and iconoclastic behavior. Henry V's suppression of the Lollards was pretty complete. Our own reformation led to the destruction of monasteries and the loss of thousands of religious artifacts, including manuscripts which were either destroyed or sold abroad. People died for their faith on both sides. Even though England was less damaged than other parts of Europe in the wars of religion at the time. However, even in the English Civil War, they've got Fountains Abbey from the Reformation to the left, Worcester Cathedral, which after the Battle of Worcester was little more than a shell, was used by the infantry as a barracks and used by the cavalry as a stable for the horses. And when you go to watch the cricket, you see that wonderful view, that was almost not there by 1660. Now, religion in England continued to be a contentious issue. Some would say, in some respects, it still is. Christianity, even in an era, era of ecumenical faith traditions, um, may hit raw nerves, even today. Um, listen, for example, to this description of a well-known figure from the early 17th century. You all know him. See what you think. He was a man of considerable experience as well as knowledge. Thanks to his prowess, he has acquired considerable fame and name among the soldiers. He was pleasant of approach, cheerful of manner, opposed to quarrels and strife. In a word, he was a man liked by everyone and loyal to his friends. Does that sound like Guy Fawkes to you? That was actually written by a school friend of his, who, of course, went on to become a Jesuit. Um, now, this was a man who was going to blow up Parliament in what the IRA recently would have called a spectacular, um, and there were those who said he was simply perhaps misguided, and others, of course, who go for the gunpowder, treason and plot view of the situation. So, religious intolerance, the suppression of belief, the destruction of cultural identity, cultural violence, cultural death, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. The word genocide was first coined in 1944, curiously enough. They've all been with us for a long time, though these are the phrases which we'll be picking up in the press at the present time. The aim is to destroy all records and even trace of the past so as to undermine any common history, identity, or values. So a dire uniformity can then be imposed but of course, if we no longer learn from the past, then errors are bound to be um, repeated in the future. Can a society actually go backwards? What about Cambodia? What about the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda, in the news even this week? What about Shining Path in Peru, which seems to be making a comeback? They're all indicative of attempts at radical social change, which had, or might have had, serious consequences, but have led to years of violence, uncertainty, and upheaval for the populations involved. Now, the desire to rewrite history, to destroy the past in order to reshape the present, to exterminate whole peoples, may all be seen among the more extreme elements that have been unleashed in recent years in the Middle East, with the added complications of conflicting religious beliefs, ethnic differences, great power rivalry, and we have to admit it, oil. Now, our speakers today will be looking at the topic of cultural heritage and war from a variety of angles. So Derek Plumley, as you'll see from your programs, is a former uh, diplomat with decades of experience in the region. As a linguist myself, I'm delighted to say he's a fluent Arabic speaker, knows the region well, in particular Egypt, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, and doubtless several more. 
and he'll be speaking to us on the subject of cultural heritage in times of war and the crisis in the Middle East. So, Derek. <laughs>